Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford Digital Economy Lab lunch seminar. I'm Eric Brynjolfsson, and today's speaker is Bindu Reddy. Uh, Bindu is the CEO and co-founder of Abacus.ai. Before starting Abacus, she was the general manager of AI at Verticals at AWS. Um, her organization created and launched Amazon's personalized and Amazon forecast and the first of a kind AI services that enable organizations to create custom deep learning models easily. Prior to that, she was the CEO and co-founder of Post Intelligence, which is a deep learning company um, that was acquired by Uber. Um, Bindu was previously at Google, where she was a head of product for Google Apps, including the Docs, Spreadsheet, Slides, and Blogger that many of us use. Um, for the seminar, we encourage questions during the seminar. Um, if you're on Zoom, the best way to do, or the only way to do that is through the Q&A function on Zoom down there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for those of you here or at Stanford in person, just raise your hand and uh, either I will call on you or Christy Coe will call on you um, and speak up and, and just uh, I may repeat the question so that the virtual audience can hear you depending on how the mic works. So with that, um, Bindu, welcome to Stanford. Uh, please uh, tell us about AI assisted data science. Well, thank you so much, Eric, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I will start by apologizing. My throat is a little gone today, so you can see my voice is not as great, but hopefully I'll get through the seminar and I'll get through the presentation. Please feel free to ask me questions. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. So we're talking about AI assisted data science um, you know, in this presentation today. So before we even get started, let's ask this very simple, almost obvious question to most of you right now as to why bother doing AI, right? If you're in a corporate enterprise setting, AI basically helps in every aspect of that corporation or the enterprise, whether it's customer service. So if you're a Macy's or a, or a Nike or a, you know, a, a Procter & Gamble, if you have a website, transforming how you acquire, retain, and upsell customers is now almost completely powered by AI and deep learning models in most modern websites. Helps you in, uh, in terms of automating business processes. So if you're thinking about customer service or tech support or anything else, um, enterprises now start, have started to rely on AI models. And one of the most interesting um, uh, applications of AI has been planning and forecasting. So the better you can forecast and uh, hedge funds, demand forecasting companies, supply chain companies, manufacturing companies, uh, all want to forecast well. And forecasting is hard because you're predicting the future. But even there, deep learning has made a big dent in terms of making uh, forecasting easier. If you think about, I mean, now it's called the MANG companies or the MAG companies, whatever they are, the ones which are over a trillion dollars. The reason why they are over a trillion dollars, to be honest, is pretty much deep learning. Even Tesla, which probably hit a trillion recently, again, it's the autopilot. Without the autopilot, you, as you can imagine, Tesla would not be Tesla. Amazon, of course, became Amazon because it could scale up to billions of products, able to like actually figure out how much inventory you need of a particular product in a particular place uh, pretty accurately using deep learning models. Facebook, of course, the heart of Facebook is newsfeed as the heart of uh, Twitter is the newsfeed AI. Um, YouTube, 70% of all of its recommendations are served by um, an AI model. And of course, we all know Siri. So fundamentally, AI is in all part, uh, in, in, pretty much in all aspects of our life. It's, uh, and, and deep learning is um, prevalent pretty much in a day. I think you're hitting six to 10 deep learning models. Inferences from that model you know, basically uh, are what you're using, whether you're on your digital phone or a mobile app. Lately, I'm sure a lot of you are probably following along uh, in terms of the AI hype. There's, a, a, you know, uh, there's been a lot of buzz around what's called generative AI. Generative AI is basically the ability for AI to create things. So we've got AI creating marketing, email. We've also seen some really beautiful pictures of AI creating art when you give it a prompt. I'm sure everybody's heard of Stable Diffusion or DALI, where AI has been creating really great art. We've also got AI creating documents, job descriptions, user insights, and so on. So, Fantastic. Everybody loves AI. AI is going to take over the world. And, and yet, as we, um, you know, um, as we think about AI today, you'll see that only about 30% of organizations have actually applied AI in a big way in their organization. Uh, and when they do apply it, they see a huge increase in their key metrics, whether that be revenue, cash flow, or, or uh, profit, you see anywhere between 30 to 128% increase in those metrics once you actually put AI models in production. 
And the key part here is AI models in production. So in spite of all the hype you see with open AI, with stable diffusion and so on and so forth, what you're not seeing that much of is AI being used ubiquitously everywhere. Of course, a Google or a Facebook can use it, but if you think about like say even a, you know the examples that I gave you earlier, like a Nike or a Macy's or a Sephora or one of these Fortune 500 companies and you ask them, how many deep learning models do you have in production today? And they're probably going to say less than a handful, if, if that. Now, why is that? The reason for um, deep learning uh, and AI models being in production, um, not being in production, is really the multiple components you need to get that going. So one part of this is the data science, the data science ability to build models, but the other part of this is to continually build those models on an ongoing basis, make sure that the model is actually correct, uh, the ability to debug the model, the ability to run pipelines and so on. So if you are uh, using a cloud vendor, let's just say you're using AWS, you're basically talking about using anywhere between nine to 10 different AWS services, which all need to be orchestrated together to build your deep learning model in production and keep that deep learning model continuing to run in production. So it tends to be a very difficult job. And even if you talk to like say a big tech company like Google or Facebook and you call them up and be like, hey, how long did you think uh, it took you to take a model and put it in production? It'll be months, if not sometimes years. And if you talk to somebody else who's not in deep tech, it even takes longer than that. So lately, um, and this is uh, uh, Abacus.ai, which I'm the CEO co-founder of, has been working on this quite a bit. We, you know, there, there are these systems called end-to-end -end MLOps systems. And these systems basically allow you to easily operationalize or productionize your model, allow you to go to production quickly, which is absolutely essential to achieve any kind of ROI from your AI model. Now, I just use the you know, buzzword MLOps, what does that mean, right? ML, MLOps actually has a bunch of different um, uh, you know, uh, modules. It starts all the way from like your data source getting that data, cleaning that data up, understanding what that data is, then training models from there, and then deploying the model, and then the final piece, which is monitoring, diagnosing, and understanding what that model um, uh, is doing in production. And this is not easy stuff, because we're talking about five or six different modules, each module being pretty complex, pretty deep, and then having everything kind of talk to each other in a coherent and a cohesive way. So what you need, modern data science platforms or MLOps platforms really have a lot of capabilities. So just take Abacus for example, or for that matter, some of uh, the other platforms, we're talking about a whole bunch of different components that need to be stitched together in a very easy to use way. This, let's take YouTube recommendations as an example. If you're, if you're looking at YouTube today, you're probably, let's say you're watching a video, and then right after that video, you're gonna see another video, right? That video is a recommendation for you based on the video that you watched, the time that you watched the video uh, at, where you watched the video, a whole bunch of different features like this, plus your video viewing history. So it takes all of that information, it feeds it to a giant deep learning model. The deep learning model in real time, meaning in about 100 milliseconds, tells you what other video you should watch. And when um, YouTube launched this deep learning called, model called YouTube Next, its revenue rocketed up. If you look at YouTube, uh, Google's revenue today and its uh, market cap, a lot of it comes from the strength of YouTube and a lot of that comes from this deep learning model. Now to make this work, you need to have a ton of different pieces, right? You need to get all of your data streaming in. So as I click on my, as like millions of people who use YouTube, click on their browsers, all of that data needs to get like streamed into two YouTube servers. Um, then it, the data has to be processed in what is called a real-time feature store. And this is humongous amounts of data processed so that it can be sent to those machine learning models. You go to those, uh, uh, the, uh, the data goes to the machine learning model and immediately the models at scale have to respond back with the results. And then all of this has to work smoothly. So you need model monitoring and drift. And on top of all this, you might have some data which is real time, like what I'm clicking. And then there's some data which is in your database. So you might wanna mix that data again in near real time and make, make all that happen. So if you think about what's the challenge in, you know, in real world AI, it's less the model even, it's this whole process, the, the end to end of like running these models at scale in production. Same problem with Twitter, same problem with Facebook and so on. So uh, 
now that we have, let's just say, we, you know, you have an MLOps platform or an AI platform with all of these modules, which, make it re which makes it really easy for you to build those models. Let's pretend that you have all the plumbing and the pipelines. What next, right? Because that, that doesn't mean that now you're off to the races because you still have to build the model based on your data. So what we at Abacus at least propose and have like right now, I believe is adopted a little bit by uh, big tech as well, including Google, uh, Amazon and Microsoft is what we call the layer cake approach to AI. Now, what does that mean? What that means basically is there are some simple problems that the AI can solve for you. So just imagine if you had like a simple table uh, where you have to figure out which is a bunch of users, you have a lot of attributes about these users and you want to figure out when these users are going to churn out. That's a relatively simple problem, nothing too difficult there. You can imagine giving that table to uh, uh, AI expert engine or an auto ML engine as they're called, and uh, you know, getting results quickly. You don't have to cre you know, create the YouTube uh, example I gave you is like on the fairly complex side. The uh, churn model that I'm giving you is on the simple side. So the approach uh, that a lot of vendors and um, the community has taken to putting models in production is saying that if you have simple models, let the AI build the model for you, keep it simple, and go to production. If you have much more difficult models, you go down to the bottom layer, you have a bunch of ML experts. They have to go off and build these algorithms, they have to go off and build these models, as well as run that whole MLOps um, pipeline, either using a platform or by themselves, and make sure that the end-to-end -end works. So given that uh, um, you know, the layer cake approach makes sense, you will see that most uh, cloud vendors have what, what they call auto ML products, Abacus uh, has this also integrated within uh, our platform. And the top layer is basically that, you know, kind of that auto ML layer where you basically can read the data directly from the data source. Um, there's, a, uh, there's like an expert AI engine which sits in between, figures out and understands what the data is. This is these are simple data sets. Uh, uh, and then basically comes up and trains thousands, if not tens of thousands of models to find the best model that fits the data and then it gives you those predictions. So that's, uh, that's basically, uh, uh, you know, generally called AutoML. What Abacus does and what has become really kind of popular lately is what's called domain-specific neural architecture search. So this is AI building AI, just to be precise. So what, what this is doing is this domain-specific neural architecture search is a neural network in itself, which looks at the data and builds neural networks based on that data. So it's literally AI building AI. So the uh, expert AI engine will basically look at the data, understand it, figure out the nuances in the data set, understand what types of neural architectures make sense, and, 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 and will go off and build um, you know, a model which is uh, uh, ideal for that data set. And so this is the first piece of AI-assisted data science in some ways, because you know, why do data scientists have to go build each model by hand, right? And even if they did it, they, you know, it'll take them a lot of time to try every single algorithm, every single type. What we are envisioning is just like how the generative models initially, uh, you know, were able to generate text or generate art. And fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, my opinion is that these generative models are going to tag team with their human counterparts in the future. And basically, uh, we are going to have an AI assisted workforce. I mean, I don't see humans kind of going out of the loop anytime soon because there's a lot of small decisions you have to make in any job. But I do see uh, a world very quickly, even I mean, as of today maybe, um, where you know, humans are going to constantly supervise the AI. They're going to use AI systems to get their job done. And really the first part for data scientists where we have a lot of depth in this area is this domain specific NAS where you know, it's helping the data scientist create a model really quickly. Once I know what my data set looks like, once I've cleaned it, once I've understood it, send it to this module and uh, voila, you've got the best model that, you know, uh, that the system can come up with. The other piece of this is a lot of data science is about data wrangling and cleaning. So there's some very obvious basic things that you can do uh, to actually remove some uh, you know, uh, problems. Like clean, like obviously you can do something like Arizona and AZ are the same, or like how do you impute missing values? These are some very standard techniques. So I would say this is level one of this approach where we're getting the AI to help you, uh, you know, build your um, AI ML model or system in production. So- Bindu, can I ask a question about that? Absolutely. Um, how, how domain specific is that? Do you find that there's some data wrangling techniques that cut across lots of different, I mean, you know, you've worked with many different kinds of companies, or is it something that you really need um, some specific knowledge of the, of the domain? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. I mean, I think we should, I mean, here the word domain is being used in the context of a problem type. So personalization versus time series versus NLP, not in the context of an industry, if that makes sense. So we're looking at it in terms of two things. The, the specificity you need is one, what is the type of problem you're solving? Like time series problems are inherently, at the moment at least, inherently different from NLP, even though you know there's a convergence of these transformer architectures. And then there is the other part of this is the data sets are going to have some nuances. So for example, in time series, if you look at a demand forecast, which is let's say Amazon forecasting demand, you will see things uh, you know which are very spiky because maybe you know you bought people bought, bought a bunch of shoes um, in winter or whatever boots in winter and not so much in summer. Uh, but uh, you know if you look at like uh, forecasting uh, stock prices, which hedge hedge funds will do, uh, it's it's not spiky, right? It's more continuous and it's a slightly different. Um, so there we're basically talking about forecasting and NLP being domain specific, but also kind of like those shapes of data being different in these kind of subdomains. So that's where the nuance comes in. The good news is this can be generalizable, right? It's not like you need to know exactly what's happening in Macy's. All you need to know is Macy's is doing a personalization project, which is e-commerce, and that helps. And that's how Abacus has done it. And it's very effective if you do it that way. So and can you even take it one step further and, 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 and uh, share data sets. I mean, like, uh, especially for some of the generative models, are there some underlying data that everybody's using that sort of, or, or in finance, like obviously you need to clean up the stock ticker information. And it, it, is that something that, that multiple clients kind of benefit from each other? Or do, do you kind of do something specific for each one? Yeah, so NAS basically creates the data set, uh, you know, creates the custom model from scratch on their data. So de again, depending on the use case, like I'll go through NLP right now. With NLP and vision, you want to share all the knowledge uh, using pre-trained models. So classic there is using something like a GPT-3 or like even like a BERT model where you're, where you're taking all the data sets from across the world and pre-training a model and then using the customer's data set as an, you know, as an additional top layer. But when, when it comes to things like forecasting, that's still TBD. It's not entirely clear that we can use like a bunch of time series data sets. We're working on it, by the way. Good question. TBD uh, you mean to be determined? <laughs> TBD means to be determined. Okay, I, mean, I just wanted to make sure I hadn't missed uh, some new, new technology. Sorry, <laughs> TBD is to be determined. So we're working on it. There is no like, uh, you know, large uh, foundation model for some of this tabular data yet. Uh, no famous one, at least. Um, for what it's worth, Abacus is actually working on one of them, we'll see. Um, but yeah, so the idea here is the NAS technique right now just makes the best model out of your data set, like the customer data set. Uh, very, very active field of research. Uh, we'd like to think of ourselves as leaders in the area. Uh, you know, we publish at NeurIPS, which is on the top uh, AIML conferences uh, every year. This year, we have four uh, publications there as well. Um, so if, if at all, you are one of those geeks who are going to NeurIPS, come say hi to us. We are, we are also hosting a social there. Uh, but, you know, other companies, obviously, Google, etc., do research in this area as well. Now, we talked about NAS for some time, but if you talk to some data scientists, they're going to be very skeptical about this. They're going to be like, hey, that's not enough. You know, basically, and this is true, you have to have your data in a particular way, you would have had to clean it, you would have had to type it and so on, before you can send it to an AutoML uh, you know, tool. So, and even if you did, it only helps with model creation, right? You're not going to be able to do like the retraining, the pipelines, the monitoring, there's all of those pieces we talked about. So the, all the other the models uh, do need, uh, modules do need automation. So there's a lot of work still, be, still to be done. And real world data tends to be pretty complex. So there's a lot of data wrangling and data processing to be done. So if you talk to a data scientist, they're not going to be very impressed with you if you said, hey, you know, I have this great, fantastic way to build models because they're going to be like, my headache is all about data wrangling and munging and processing, it's a pain. So what next? So then we talked about the top layer of that layer cake. Now let's go to the bottom layer. So what happens today in the bottom layer is for the simple problems, we use these AutoML techniques. For the hard problems, we have to just write code the old fashioned way. So, um, you know, people use these things called Jupyter Notebooks, Google Collab, very popular. Uh, Abacus itself has its own integrated notebook as well. So data, science's favor data scientist's favorite tool is a typical Jupyter Notebook. 
and a note a notebook is nothing but like a python environment which helps you like iterate and experiment on things really quickly so you and most people use python today to build out their models so if you look at tensorflow pytorch what what have you all of them have python are um, uh, have python libraries that you can use and build these models so data scientists will bring their own model bring their own algorithm and then what what happens if i build my model in a notebook right the next step is to plug and play that model into an MLOps system because we talked about MLOps in the beginning, having all of those modules. Now imagine, let's go back to our YouTube example. Uh, you have all of these pieces, our data coming in through streaming, batch predictions, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, streaming and batch uh, uh, merging, uh, model training, which happens every two hours, metrics, calculations, deployment, and so on. But now let's say I'm an engineer or a new engineering team. I have a new idea for a new model. I've built out this new model uh, and now I want to try it on YouTube. How does it work today? So what YouTube does today is they have this massively big experiment system where I as an engineer can bring my own model and plug it into my ML, into their MLOps platform and 1% or 0.1% of traffic will go to that model. So there are many pieces to ML AI systems as we talked about, and that is this idea of taking your own algorithm, plugging it into this MLOps system, and then having that MLOps system actually put, put that model into production and then start measuring how the pro uh, model will work. And if you look at these uh, different problem types of domains, there is this, uh, you know, one big domain is tabular machine learning. This is data which is not like documents or images. These are da this is data which is present in databases. If you look at any standard enterprise, 90% of their AI models are tabular uh, models, right? Because you have all of this data in enterprises, like information about the user, information about, let's say, if you're an insurance company claims, you know, if you're calculating risk, that's a tabular model. So there's tons of tabular, forecasting is tabular, are all tabular models, personalization are all tabular models. And there are all these steps that you go through from data analysis, defining target, the cleaning data set, then training models, and here's our auto ML piece right here the neural nets, trees, logistic regression. We try every type of algorithm to see which algorithm, which model will work. You can evaluate the model, choose the best model, and like deploy that. Now let's just take a different tack and look at how personalization looks. Personalization is a type of tabular data, but things get vastly more com complex when we're looking at personalization. Because now we've got that streaming data coming in from your website. We have user item interactions. They, they, are, they are sequences. So a user is clicking on, say, video A, B, goes away, comes back next day, C, D, E. All of that information needs to be stored. This item catalog data. Excuse me. Uh, Bindu, while you're, <laughs> let me give your voice a little bit of a rest. Um, there, there are a number of questions in the in the Q and A. Um, I don't know whether you can see them, but let, let me uh, let me pass on a couple of them. And uh, and uh, you know, they, they might be good for a longer discussion later. But also, I think some of them you can you can touch on now. Uh, here's one from Wajiha Ahmed, and she asks, um, in your experience with customers, have you seen returns from AI being higher for the larger, or older companies that have access to more data, or the smaller companies and and startups? Or, or what are some of the trade-offs there? Yeah, so access to data is definitely interesting, but really moving fast is more interesting. Uh, large companies don't move very quickly. Startup, so the way I think about it is the middle companies are the most, uh, the, the companies which are not too old, <coughs> which have enough data, but which are not startups are the ones who have been most effective. Like, like this, let's take examples, right? Like, uh -huh. like a Lyft or an Uber, uh, yeah. you know, the ones which are putting uh, uh, AI models into market really quickly. Of course, we Abacus helps a lot of Fortune 500, so we're trying to get them accelerated as well. But um, more data, of course, much richer models, but also more headaches. So it, if you're in the middle, that's your sweet spot. If you're a startup, okay. you don't have data. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. By the way, feel free to talk more quietly. I mean, we can hear you just fine. So I, you don't, yeah. Um, and, and there are lots of really interesting questions in the Q&A. A lot of them are sort of broader questions about AI and, and implications. Um, I'd be very happy to get to them, but I want to give you a chance to finish uh, you know, the main part of your presentation. <clears throat> sure. So let's do uh, real-time personalization. Things get a lot more complex here, right? Because we've got the streaming data, we've got that user item interaction, and then all of this is happening in real time, as I talked to you about in the YouTube example. So more pieces, and all of these pieces again have to work together. This is actually very hard to do, and if you ask me, 
Today, real-time personalization is in production in like less than 20 places in the world. And this includes things like Netflix, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. So all your top apps, of course, the king of this today, like by far the king is TikTok. And that's why you're seeing TikToks like, uh, uh, you know, a growth and market cap going insane. So this is very hard. And when then done right, is very beautiful to see. And, yeah, uh, about TikTok, uh, about TikTok, I mean, I often hear that used as an example of, of somebody, a company that, that's done AI very effectively and very effective in engaging and, and, and beating a lot of other companies at it. Is there a, a, a simple under explanation or understanding of, of why they've been able to do that so much better than others and why it seems like other people, other companies haven't been able to, to match them? Yeah, I think, yes. The uh, issue is a combination of both the algorithm and the form function. I mean, the short video, uh, it really helps. Like, let me just say, uh, uh, explain what I mean. So usually when you look at session length in various different places, let's say on Facebook, YouTube or TikTok, uh, most people <clears throat> have a lot of like ADD. So if you look at YouTube, you're going to see a lot of people dropping off in between these videos. Just give me one second. <coughs> Sorry, this has been my most fun talk <laughs> in terms of my uh, voice, but hopefully uh, this uh, now I'm in a better shape. Okay, so when you look at TikTok, it's a session, uh, it's the type of video, which is um, the short video. So people can, the ADD part goes away, so you can go from one video to another very easily. And the other piece is the, um, is the algorithm. The algorithm basically kind of keeps you coming back. And there, uh, the YouTube algorithm is similar, but the YouTube is hampered by the long form video, if that makes sense. <coughs> Can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, hear you well. <coughs> and there are a couple of questions about feature engineering. Um, you should, would you like me to, you'd like to take them now or do you wanna keep going? Uh, I'll take them now. Okay. And, and Victor, we, we can't see your video, by the way. Uh, that's by yeah. design, if it's okay. 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 <laughs> um, so Sandy Pentland, uh, comments that in, in his experience, feature engineering is more effective than precisely which model or algorithm is used. Um, similarly, data fabric architecture and federated AI is key to avoiding most most of the cost of deep prep and cleaning. Uh, you'd be interested in a comment. Why don't we just take that one first because it's already kind of complicated. Yeah. So feature engineering, yes. I mean, that is true to some extent, but not so much today. So before, feature engineering was super important because people use these things called classic, uh, classical machine learning algorithms called trees. Trees rely on feature engineering completely. The modern day transformer actually doesn't require as much feature engineering and has somewhat equivalent performance. When it comes to forecasting and personalization, transformers, neural networks beat without even featureization on trees. When it comes to something like regression, which is like tabular machine learning, trees will still win with featureization, but transformers are catching up. So, you know, that observation is still more or less right. What was the second question? Um, the, the second part of his question, well, I, I think that, cov oh, th th that covers that one. The, another person who had a similar question, I think you mostly answered it, but uh, Utul Matu, uh, says, uh, given neural networks, at least feed forward vanilla neural networks, which combine straight features and weights after data cleansing, how much work goes into feature engineering? And is the complexity low for some cases, depending on the architecture too? Yeah, that's a good question again. Yes, absolutely. Feed forward networks, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, you, do, you have to do more feature engineering there. What we've seen recently is the rise of the LSTM and the transformer more so, right? I mean, if, you, if you're following these neural network advances, uh, in 2016, there was a paper which, which was very seminal. It was called Attention is All You Need. It was a new architecture in 2016. Now it's six years old. But it's still one of the most uh, uh, you know, eff uh, efficient or kind of like also ubiquitous architectures. If you look at GPT-3, that's mm -hmm. a transformer. If you look at, uh, you know, uh, if you look at... Uh, a lot of the personalization models in production right now in Facebook, those are transformers. So yes, the transformers make it really easy for you to feature less, you know, reduce feature engineering. And, and can those be used for things like recommendation engines? 
Yes, yes, absolutely. So that that's the new a new part of this. Transformers can be used for language, for recommendations, for forecasting. It's just become some. It's like you know one the one ring that rules them all. So yes, uh, off late. That's uh, that's been the trend. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, there there are kind of nuances to each of these architectures, but the overall architecture is the transformer architecture. Okay, great, thanks. And so let's. I mean, now let's. We talked about personalization forecasting, very common in enterprises. The next one, of course, is language. Language, of course, is has been a great area of research for AGI, as we all know, because language is fundamentally how we communicate, how we think, and everything else. But in the enterprise world, language has fewer, or not as many maybe, but fewer applications. I think over time it'll get more. We'll have more of those. Classic example will be kind of extracting labels, like let's let's say you have a bunch of resumes or contracts. So extracting key terms from those contracts and storing them in a structured database automatically. So even uh, doing something like that today uh, can be done using kind of these state-of-the-art language models. And here again, you can imagine, you know, doing auto ML on all these language models and picking the one which best works for your data. Now, of course, GPT-3, which is the state of the art at this moment in language, basically does something, goes a step further than this. This, the diagram that I have right now is what we have in production in a lot of places, including say a Google or what have you. But GPT-3 is a prompt based model. You can just ask it a question and it can give you an answer. And it can also learn quickly. So we think the future of language is not going to be as much, you know, this kind of engineering where you're actually fine tuning or changing existing models. We'll just do prompt engineering where we can just ask an AI model some question and it'll respond with some answer. Amazing. Yeah, I've seen people, you know, doing using it as a search engine, for instance. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, and people use SQL, you know, people use it to like uh, query a database. It's amazing stuff. So now we went through all this language personalization, um, tabular data, etc. All of these modules are actually are not non-trivial. There are companies dedicated to each module sometimes, right? If you are like, let's say Netflix, the, just the featureization will be a huge module, which you can literally have a company do for you. <coughs> so still, there's a lot of manual data science work. I mean, you go talk to Netflix or even Google, they'll say, hey, we, ha we hire, what, 10,000 data scientists? So there are people they are hiring across the board to do data wrangling, featureization, model creation, experimentation, prototyping, productionization. Still a lot of work to do, still a lot of pain. So how do we reduce that pain in the future? The first piece is there's a lot of rote work that all data scientists have to do. They have to like look at the data. That can be automated really easily, right? You can imagine like every time you have a data set, it'll, there is like an analyzer of the data set, which you see here, which analyzes the size of the data, the shape of the data, the different columns. You also can imagine, uh, you know, every time there is any kind of monitoring or drift, you have these dashboards which get created automatically. So in machine learning, there are multiple steps, like we talked about data exploration, that can be automated. Metrics evaluation, that can be automated monitoring and drift that can be automated so now imagine having a turnkey system where you have your data sets all connected up a lot of automation in terms of this dashboarding so you don't have to go build your own dashboards which are a huge pain and then now once you can take a look at that dashboards understand the data and then try to see how you can cast that into machine learning uh, features and machine learning models same thing post um, creating a model like once you've created a model you can imagine there being this idea of you know this thing called drift now what is drift what happens is when people create a model unfortunately these models are quite brittle today and what that means is uh, you, you 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 end up having uh, models which are uh, there I'm back on video too hey let's hope yeah I great stay. great to have you back <laughs> Let's hope I stay this way. So, uh, so there's a model drift is when you actually put a model in production and over time, the data which you used to train the model, that data distribution changes. The classic example of this is, let's say I did a churn model, right? And before people were churning out because they were mainly subscribing to my website from say the New York Times or whatever, but now I started a new channel and the channel is from Facebook. And the model has never seen users from Facebook. And so now the model doesn't know how to predict churn on those users. And that's what it means to have drift. The, the data that the model was trained on is different from the data at prediction. When that happens, 
you see that the model starts becoming ineffective. So this is what happens a lot today in the world, in enterprise use cases. They, they train a model, switch it on, go away. Four months later, the model's not working. You were like, oh, what happened? That's because you're not monitoring drift, not understanding what changed, and not retraining the model. So this whole process has to be automated. Think of that as model CICD, really important to do right. And right now- Can you explain to everybody what the acronym CICD uh, means? Yeah, it's continuous integration and continuous development. So like if you're doing code, like if you're a software engineer in a large engineering organization, uh, I mean, not a lot of people do this today because it's hard, but the idea is once you write any piece of code, you can test that code and then you can integrate it into your larger code base and then push that code into production. So if you have this process called CI-CD, which is basically, you know, as you write code, it gets pushed into production, quite difficult to set it up properly, by the way, then it's called, you know, CI-CD. And now model CI-CD is, is similar, right? Imagine if you automatically knew that uh, every uh, one month you have new training da data because you have a new data, the, the data is coming into the database. You can pull that every month. You can then like train the model, calculate the metrics, um, and then push the model to production. And then on an ongoing basis, you'll be monitoring drift. Anytime there's drift, you'll alert the data scientist and say, hey, there's a problem. So that's uh, basically the drift issue. And then uh, there is also after that um, explanations. So a lot of times business uh, folks will say, hey, I don't believe much in your model. And so we need to actually have the model explain itself. Now, this is a really hard piece of MLOps primarily because we as a community don't have good explanations anyway. So we have some techniques which are there, not a lot, but those techniques, uh, we're working on them. So it's an area of research, but to the extent that we're working on them, we do have the ability to like tell you, uh, to tell the customers why a particular prediction is what it is. In this particular example, you're seeing, you know, there's a whole bunch of features which went into whether the customer is going to renew or not. This is a renewal model. It's going to predict whether in the next renewal cycle, are they going to renew an upsell, renewal flat, or like on a churn. So the churn model that I'm talking about, flat, you know, here's all the different, um, uh, you know, um, uh, states. Uh, this is telling you why and which, you know, which features are going into that prediction. So this helps kind of convince business users why machine learning is useful. You can also do monitoring and data quality the same way. <coughs> and this is when you have a real-time machine learning model. You can actually get uh, results and measure latency and errors so that you're actually making sure that your model is actually working in production and is effective. So you want, you want to have real-time latency dashboards, you want to have support for streaming, and you want to be able to deploy anywhere. So again, this is basically saying, how do I take my model, operationalize it, put it in production, measure drift, understand and get explanations, and make sure everything is working well. Okay, so now we've more or less covered the, I would say the bread and butter of putting AI models into production. There was one piece around AutoML, then there's the other piece about MLOps, which is mostly dashboarding, monitoring, data quality, and so on. Now, this is the third piece that we've started work on and we believe is going to be the future of data science. So every, I mean, I talked about large language models before, like GPT-3 is one. The reason why we're all excited about large language models is the large, uh, the model like GPT-3 can, can, you know, have a conversation with you. And what it's really doing is there is text input, which you send it. And then based on the text input, it'll give you a, a response. Now, let me talk a little bit about these models, how they showed up and what happened here. So initially, uh, you know, these models were trained on data sets which were out on the web, right? And people trained small models with 1.5 billion parameters, and they were kind of effective. What they realized over time, like OpenAI, Microsoft, NVIDIA, et cetera, is that the more data they got in and the, more, and the bigger the model was, the model became more performant. So it's, it was able to answer questions, it was able to you know, actually get human level kind of accuracy. Uh, as they started training bigger and bigger and bigger models. And now the challenge, as you can imagine with this, is it's very difficult to train these 175 billion parameter models. It costs about $2 million, I think, to train per month, um, you know, 
uh, and, and there's a lot of iteration. I, I, I've even seen, I mean, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, you have to keep updating these slides every few months. I've seen uh, bigger models and bigger numbers. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, this is 175 billion. I'm sure now it's 500 billion. <laughs> yeah, so, well, yeah, I think Palm, Google's Palm was 540 billion a, a few months ago. And, exactly, and you're bigger. right, of yeah. course. Uh, yeah, yeah, 540. So, yeah, so they keep going up and up. It also causes this problem of like, Normal people can't train these models easily, of course. But uh, you know these models have really worked out and they've really been great in terms of their performance. Uh, example, you know, if you're, uh, you can talk to it. I'm sure everybody's heard about that story where there was a Google engineer who basically thought that the AI was um, sentient, right? And uh, then Google had to put him on leave, and that's because it really appears sentient. So, you know, it, it acts and talks and behaves like a human, and it's able to do this really, really well. And this is text generation, for example. Now, what's really, really interesting and what's really taken off, and I don't know if you guys have all seen it, and I, would, I was hoping to show you a demo. Let's see if I can do this here. Is, uh, I mean, some of you might, might have seen it, is the GitHub Copilot. This has been revolutionary to programming. And what you're going to see here, I mean, it's very simple. It's just, you know, you basically can write code. The AI can write code for you once you write this comment. Determine whether the sen a sentiment of text is positive, use a web service. This whole piece of code was written by a GPT-3-like model, except instead of being trained on language, it got trained on code. And you know, if you look at this, this is SQL. You know, basically, this whole piece of code again, you know, is written by uh, uh, the AI. It's, so it's really amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's 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 freaky. It's basically you you just say it. Look like, look at this. You just write this text here, right? This is this is written, and then uh, the code is written. So yeah, now Greg Brockman was recently saying that the, the coders at OpenAI about forty percent of the code they they. Uh, generate now is, is written by uh, in this way. Yeah, I mean, we've started writing our code this way too, and it's very, very effective. And it's, you know, it's easy to be skeptical about it. When we first started, we were like, oh, we don't think it's going to work, but it's just working really well. And this also means that... Right? And let me just, it, it, I mean, this, there's, there's so many questions in Q&A, but let, yeah. one of them um, I think we as well take now, which is from Ming Zhu. Uh, what, what is the general trend in low code or no code um, in, in AI? I mean, you just mentioned a little bit, but you want to say a bit more? Yeah. So, I mean, see, the problem with low code so far has been that if you go down like fully to no code, then there's always going to be some place in the uh, some place in the process where you'll have to insert some code. So no code is not really an option, I think. Low code, yes, sure, uh, that could be an option. But I would say AI assisted code, like you know, where you're not necessarily being, uh, you know, necessarily writing code yourself, but maybe telling an AI assistant to write the code alongside the end-to-end -end ML ops, alongside the auto ML is the answer because that gives you infinite flexibility, right? Uh, because in real world situations, the, it's real world situations are messy. There's never anything where you can be like, oh, I expect the forecasting data to look like this. It won't. You know, something or the other will be wrong. You'll have to fix it using some code. So uh, the way I see it is code is not going anywhere, but us writing code, us being humans writing code is going to become less and less. And in some ways you could call that low code, but you have to still be able to understand and supervise that code. You see what I'm saying? So if you're somebody who doesn't know any co programming, like I always joke that I can't use Copilot because my, my programming is rusty. If I try to program within the Abacus platform, the engineers are going to kick me out, but I can't use Copilot still because I don't know how to like, you know, debug slash, uh, you know, verify the code that the copilot is writing. So, would you say it helps most kind of middle middle level coders or, or, or better coders? I mean, you sort of you need a certain level of basic proficiency for it to be useful. And then, um, I've also heard that if you're if you're super good at coding, maybe it doesn't add as much. Is that what your sense is as well? Yeah, my sense is is actually it increases the productivity of almost all programmers who are anywhere between let's say mid, mid low to even like high, uh, you know, uh, level. So it basically just takes whatever their productivity is and probably I won't say double right yet, 
I would say like increases it by 20 to 30 percent. So like I write code, but there's a lot of code I can't write. I can just imagine writing more code because of this and understanding it. But a classic example of uh, like the failure mode is this. Let's imagine I don't know SQL, right? And then I say, hey, write uh, SQL to like combine these two tables. It shows you like some SQL. Right? This is no way for me to check if this is true. Maybe I can test it on some few data sets and check. But you know, you have to be able to like look at that result and say, yeah, that's right. And a lot of times, actually, for all its like you know fanciness, it does make mistakes. So you have to catch those mistakes, and that's the hard part of this right now. Now, right? No, it's it's similar when it generates English. You know, it'll it'll write some very plausible sounding text. Then you read it more right. carefully, and you realize that it's not factually correct. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why you need to be a bit of an expert, if that makes sense. Uh, and so it's easy to be like, oh, look, it looks great and <laughs> go on and then it's all wrong. But uh, I think that's going away, though. I mean, like next two to three years, we're going to get better at this. Uh, and so and uh, there's a question at Stanford in, in the room. Um, can we can we take that? I we only have about 10 minutes left, by the way, or a little sure. over that. So um, let's take the question from uh, from Stanford and then. Um, we have a lot of really interesting questions in the in the Q and A um, about broader topics um, as well. If you're interested in taking those, sure. so I just want to yeah. calibrate a little bit. But let's let's go for the question in the room first. Maybe Christy, you can help uh, manage that. Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll, uh, with time in mind, I'll just try and keep it very short. This is really interesting. So I just wanted to ask, what do you think about the future? Uh, skill requirements or requirements to compete effectively in this space? Is it going to be around? You know better data because you said that the code isn't going to be obsolete but does this bring with it new requirements in terms of companies staying uh, competitive or even individuals staying competitive in the ai space you know given the the, the hype around software yeah. to and, and things like that so any thoughts yeah let's start with individuals first and then we'll go to companies so when you're talking about individuals being competitive in terms of being i think really good data scientists uh, I think what it takes is not really like your ability to write Python or, I mean, sure, you have to know, know how to write, write Python, but you don't have to be a super productive Python programmer or a SQL programmer, but it is about your creativity, right? And casting these models. A lot of times what happens is business comes to you and says, this is my problem. And knowing how to cast the problem to be a machine learning problem is what AI can't do today. And I don't see it doing that like in the next three or four years either. So humans, again, I mean, my analogy is uh, we're going to, uh, the data scientists are going to be the Tony Starks of tomorrow because, uh, you know, they are basically like commanding the computer to do A, B or C, but they are thinking about how to create that solution. So it's, uh, so that's a very important skill, casting the problem. And how do you do that? You basically like get practice, you learn how data science works, you learn what machine learning can do, and then you look at real world problems and you, you get better and better at casting. So I think that's one way to stay competitive. The second way is a lot of data scientists, you know, try to like, say no to tools and that, that's changing now. They think that they can build everything from scratch from end to end, but you know what? stand on the shoulders of giants. There's no point like trying to do everything on your own because you're going to be re reinventing the wheel. That's like saying, hey, I'm not going to use a wheel when the wheel has been invented, right? So uh, so that's the other part about staying competitive, casting and like applying new tools as soon as possible. In terms of companies themselves, I mean, I think this has been, this point has been made before. If you are as AI first as possible, you're going to succeed. A lot of companies still are taking their time when it comes to adopting AI. They're still kind of not thinking about like out of the box disruptive applications that they can build. Um, you know, if you are like a large company, you're not, you shouldn't just be thinking about applying standard things like churn models or personalization or whatever. You should be thinking about like vision and like potentially how the future of like say e-commerce is going to be. I mean, three years down the line, let's say, I mean, we work with a lot of companies in the fashion uh, industry. And I think one of the things that uh, I don't believe anyone's, I mean, maybe there are small projects, but nobody's working in a big way on is that, you know, why do I have to go to, um, a uh, store to try out dresses. I mean, this is an age, age old problem, right? Which right now we have the technology to solve very well. Can I just try on my address uh, on, on myself uh, and see exactly how it would look immediately? 
So these are the kinds of things which you mean, uh, like have the model uh, show what you would look like with a different dress, different color, different style. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like using a you know mobile phone or what have you. Like I could, I should just be able to shop. Like when I shop online, I don't know whether this thing is going to fit me or why do I have to go like uh, to the mall today because I want to try it out, right? The fitting room and whatnot uh, is a real world experience. Now, if you look at uh, uh, tomorrow, you don't need to be able to don't need to do that. You should be able to try on your shoes your clothes what have you uh, you know virtually and and we have the tech for it i mean it's still hard to do i'm not saying it's an easy tech but uh, you know uh, some of these companies should be thinking disruptively and spending i would say a considerable amount of their budget on these kinds of ideas hopefully that answers the question uh Okay, actually, uh, this is my last slide. Let me, I'll just finish and then I can take questions. So That's all good. I was saying is, uh, you know, we need to, uh, we need to have code gen as part of this. The code is not going away, but code gen will help. So when you look at AI assisted data science, what we're talking about is an end to end ML ops platform, which is just the plumbing, but it needs to scale. It needs to be cohesive. It needs to work well. Then we talk, uh, then you need the domain specific neural architecture search for model creation. Uh, I mean, why would you want to create the model when this thing will create the best model? Then you want the data visualization and drift monitoring for all the dashboarding and all the road stuff. And then the code gen to program it all end to end, right? So if you can bring all of this together, we're talking about putting your models in production and building state of the art models really, really quickly and really, really fast. And I think some system and a, a platform which combines these things is going to be the next generation tool for these data scientists. And of course, we like to believe that's us, but I think <laughs> all the cloud companies are working on it too. Is that a picture of your factory there in operation? Yeah, that's a, that's a visual representation. That's your of headquarters. The yeah. Platform. <laughs> Awesome. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Bindu. The amazing stuff. It's just filled with uh, with insight. Um, so as I mentioned, we have lots of questions. They they go range from sort of specific to, to broader ones. Um, let me uh, let me bundle a couple of them together first. Uh, Super Yantra asks, how do you build predictable sales models when external factors are always unpredictable, such as war, war, COVID, and other issues? Current models are based on past and historical data. Um, and then a related, well, possibly related question. You, you judge. Um, uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, the, from the perspective of AI in business, AI can deal with unpredictable events such as how do how does AI deal with unpredictable events such as pandemic and warfare? Can it contribute to the increasing flexibility or resilience of the firm and resource redeployment and supply chain reorganization? This is a very good question, a question that we get asked all the time, as you can imagine. So um, let me just uh, uh, first uh, start by saying. You know, fundamentally, when you're looking at ML models, ML models, yes, look at past history, but they also like weigh recent history a lot. So the, fundamentally, like the last X steps are predictive of the next Y steps. Think of it that way. So even if you're in the middle of the pandemic, you know, if you're in the middle of the pandemic, we have some data about how the system is behaving in the pandemic, right? So it, it can make educated guesses about how it will behave in the pandemic over the next, um, you know, three months. Now, of course, uh, you know, everything depends on context length, meaning how much history do you have and how much like uh, uh, into the future you want to predict. So it tends to be, believe it or not, that even during COVID, when you look at forecasting models, and if your history, if your context, or if your prediction length was small enough, AI models were doing just fine, especially, you know, one year into the pandemic, because we had one year of history and we had to go, you know, say two or three months ahead. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you can model these external factors as well. Uh, I mean, there are simple ways to model them. You can just tell the neural net something happened, like a war happened. You can say, here is something that happened. What the neural net is basically saying is, Oh, expect the pattern to change because of an external event. Now, we don't know how big that change is going to be, right? You can also do that. You can simulate data which says that war could has a bigger impact. Pandemic has maybe a less impact. I mean, it may not be true, but, you know, you get the point. You, it doesn't have to be a binary, uh, uh, you know, event that you tell it. You can also give it like weights and, you know, give it more external factors. So having said all that, what we see is that patterns are inherent in the data. And because of that, like recent history, as well as recent prediction, neural nets tend to be 
actually not you know as effective as they can be <laughs> meaning that in the end of the day forecasting or any of these models are never going to be 100% right right if you've got 80 or uh, you know 85% accuracy you're doing pretty well yeah but so so when you do see a turning point i mean is there a danger that the the model will be will be overconfident based you know suppose there's been a trend in one way for for 5 years and all the historical data is that way and then there's like a pandemic that and, and, and we humans notice that things have really changed um, it may take a while before the the, the model uh, picks up on that something it's never seen before. I mean, you, is it would it be wise maybe to to step back and and not use the model for a period until it retrains or 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 you know you see you talk about down weighting, but but how yeah. extreme? Yeah, no, that's a good point. This is like when the pandemic just happened, right? I talk about like in the middle of the pandemic, it's picked up the signal, but in the pandemic just happens, it's not picked up any signal. It has no clue. So yeah. yes, it will get it very wrong uh, right. at that point, right? Like if you are like February and the pandemic hit in March, there's no chance of getting it right. And we humans also want. So, um, I mean, maybe we know that there's something really bad happening. So. Yeah, so then you have to wait, unfortunately, or you have to wait it, as you mentioned, in some way. So there's not much choice there. W A I T and then W E I G H T. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, so, yeah, Sandy in the room has a has a question. Uh, I think Sandy. Yeah. So this is related. You know, um, the techniques that you've been talking about require or assume that there's a great deal of data. Of course, little companies don't have that, or brand new things tend not to have that which means all these techniques are biased towards large companies that have this already large market share and not small ones. And then the thing that you just said is a, another sort of consequence of that. Whenever there's something where your data is no longer directly relevant, uh, you don't really have a backup. I mean, I remember Amazon, which was brilliant in terms of their delivery, but right at the beginning of the pandemic, they were completely screwed uh, because they didn't have sort of a causal base model that they were building off of. And I wonder if you could talk about those two things. The fact that this is enshrining this sort of automatic stuff for the companies that have the biggest data and implicitly discriminating against rare things or small things or yeah. stuff like that. And, and then the non-stationarity. I mean, the one thing that everybody agrees about our world today is that it's becoming more and more chaotic which means the data is less and less current. Yeah, no, very good point. So let's talk about the first one. I think the rise of these foundation models and just to like uh, describe- can, can you turn the camera, Bindu, or is that, if you don't mind? <laughs> Sorry, it's because I, I, I'm coughing all the time. Okay. And that's Sorry. the reason I've been turning it on and off, but anyway. Just, so yeah. so um, let's see, the uh, first question was around, uh, uh, data right and so if you look at foundation models today uh, the uh, or advantaging big companies versus yeah advantaging big companies. or topics where there where you could make a foundation model a lot of things don't have that much, <coughs> excuse period, me yeah. right yeah yeah so uh absolutely right so i think this is the beginning though right foundation models just start <laughs> I mean, it's what, two, three years old right now, meaning that, I mean, just to like explain this, uh, the word foundation models is basically trying to build a model on all the data in the world and then using that model, which is usually called a pre-trained model or a foundation model to like go and do predictions. So if you're a large company, you can obviously build your own model. So if you're Nike or whatever, right? But if you are like, let's just say a startup, you have like, let's say a thousand data points, what are you going to do? You can't build your own model. You can stand on a model which has already been built on other types of data. Now, this is very prevalent as we spoke about in language, easy, because language is the same. We all speak the same uh, English language or Spanish or whatever. Very hard when it comes to like these predictive models, right? Like forecasting, et cetera. But people are working on it. I think like things like forecasting, actually we will have a foundation model, right? Because time series works in a, it's, think of it this way. The patterns of the universe are repeatable. That's part of the reason why the AI works as much as well as it does. So if you somehow have those patterns kind of like um, encompassed within a model, you can imagine 
even smaller companies taking advantage of this. Now, this is me to some extent speculating. At this moment, I do agree that the larger companies do have that advantage on certain um, you know, uh, problem types like personalization or time series or what have you. The other part of it is causality, right? Now, this is a very foundational, fundamental question in some ways. There are some of us who are big believers in neural networks being the answer to the life, the universe and everything, and some of us who aren't, right? And the, some of us who aren't are basically saying, hey, these neural networks don't have first order logic. They don't, they're not thinking machines. They don't have causality. I mean, humans can think better. I mean, my suspicion is the answer is somewhere in between. You do need causality. You do need thinking machines, but I suspect the neural nets will start thinking and reasoning too. I mean, you're seeing some of this happen now. Uh, very hard. It's a very contentious topic. I'm sure like a lot of people hate me if I, if I said neural networks are going to be coming up with this, uh, you know, with all the log logical like concepts as well. We'll see how that progresses. But yes, it's not over yet, meaning there's a lot more to do when it comes to AGI. You are going to see a lot of fun stuff happening in the next couple of years where some of these problems are going to get uh, hopefully addressed. Thank you so much, Bindu. That, that was just amazing. I appreciate you uh, powering through. I, I know that uh, you're not oh, feeling well. And, uh, I'm glad your, your voice it. lasted all that time. Um, so, so thanks so much. There are a bunch of other questions. I, I'm, one of them is real quick uh, yeah. that you might be able to answer just with a yes or no. Are you planning an IPO? <laughs> That's a great question. We just uh, we just launched uh, the company three years ago. I hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so th thanks so much. That, that was terrific. I, I have a lot. There's a lot, a lot of follow-up questions. I think we'll we'll capture some of these and, and, and share them with you because you may you may be interested in some of them. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I appreciate I'm you taking the time, about Bindu. My voice. Great. No, no, no. It, it was it was terrific. And if, if uh, we'll point people on the website to where they can learn more about Abacus and uh, and sign up for your IPO and, and everything else uh, when the time comes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so thanks so much. Thank um, you so much, Eric. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Next week, uh, uh, sorry, November 14th, our next speaker is going to be Avi Goldfarb, uh, an economist at the University of Toronto. He's going to be speaking about the disruptive economics of artificial intelligence. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.